Good evening, this is Kiana, and today we are gonna be talking about scapegoating, the scapegoating mechanism, and how it ties into how society blames whistleblowers and journalists and human rights defenders. Now, I really didn't prepare much for this video, and I initially wanted to actually tie this subject into a film that deals with scapegoating, but I actually haven't really seen a film that touches upon this particular subject. And so I think that the direction that I'm going to take this is, which is timely, is dealing with the situation with Julian Assange, who, who of course is the whistleblower that is currently detained and incarcerated in the United Kingdom, and how authority figures often use human rights defenders, activists, whistleblowers as scapegoats to make themselves feel better. Now, I recently watched a very interesting video called The Ugly Psychology Behind Scapegoating. It was a video uploaded to YouTube by Luke Burgess and his YouTube channel is called Big Think. And in this particular video, he talks about the scapegoat mechanism. And so, of course, a scapegoat is where society or a person, they're, they're transferring all the blame onto this one individual to expel or eliminate them. So, for example, you have one individual who is going to shoulder the blame for the wrongs that everyone else has done. And in the case of Julian Assange, we know that Assange, what he did was he actually leaked classified information to the public about uh, situations and crimes that were happening abroad uh, perpetuated by the United States of America. And as a result, what happened was that Assange was persecuted uh, by the U.S. government and other Western states because of this whistleblower activity. He was seen as a threat to the established order. So essentially what happened was that the established order looked at Assange as, well, what we need to do is we need to transfer all of the blame onto this person by saying that his activity has put lives at risk and we need to transfer all the blame onto this person so that everyone else, their crimes can be absolved. And do you see how this is just cathartic for the authority figures that are engaging in human rights violations, unfortunately. It's an unfortunate situation that we all find, that find ourselves in as human rights defenders. And of course, I want to say this is that I do understand that there are in the past there has been some uh, allegations against Assange that deals with violations of the rights of women and uh, I in no way condone those allegations and no, nor do I support those allegations. What I'm looking at as a human being in their right to protect the global community and their right to engage in freedom of speech and freedom of expression, which is a right that we all have. And it's unfortunate that we have authority figures today that are seeking to suppress this right to achieve their goal, which is, of course, to take attention away from the human rights wrongs that they have engaged in. So what Burgess states is that people make scapegoats when there is some fundamental truth that they don't want to acknowledge. Again, 
I, to, to reiterate that I believe that human rights defenders, of course, like myself, become the scapegoat when we speak out publicly. And Burgess acknowledges that this is how society often creates scapegoats. It, it first starts with a human rights defender actually coming out and stating something very publicly. So like for example, in my position, what I did was I wrote a critical article on the United States treatment of African Americans. And I actually wrote a subsequent article that dealt with uh, a journalist that I believe, I think it was a Bangladesh journalist who compared the, their experiences with the experiences of black Americans in the United States who were victims of police brutality. And I gave a very strong argument to say, hey, we are a distinct group and that our experiences are shouldn't be compared to those experiences in Bangladesh because these are two unique different groups under two unique different systems. And yes, that paper was kind of scathing, I would say, if you read it, but it really did hit an important point that no, the point that I made in that paper is that the, the people of Bangladesh, their experiences should not be minimized, nor should the experiences of Black Americans, their experiences with police brutality, that shouldn't be experienced as well. And then I wrote a subsequent uh, paper, or excuse me, an article in the jurist that actually dealt with authority figures in the Republic of Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, not actually investigating or giving attention to the way in which particular people are treated in direct provision. Now, after I wrote that paper, what happened was authority figures decided to make me the scapegoat because I complained. They looked at everyone else around me in direct provision and said, okay, these people in this direct provision institution, they are fleeing a different country. They're not fleeing the United States. They don't have a checkered past. And if they do have a checkered past, we don't know anything about it. And it looks better if we actually place the blame on Kiana Canada because she has a checkered past and because she her identity is one that most people will condemn. So for example, the people that I was complaining against in direct provision when I was going through something very serious, they have an identity that uh, is protected. So of course, we do understand that all groups, regardless of their identity, should be able to be protected. We shouldn't actually say, okay, because a person has many intersections that that person deserves to be the scapegoat actually to the contrary if you have many intersections you're more likely to be abused you're more likely to experience violence and discrimination and that is more reason for society and groups to stand up and to protect you but of course that didn't happen in my particular situation i was chosen to be the scapegoat just as Edward Snowden, excuse me, not Edward Snowden, but uh, Julian Assange is for Western society now is that what he did was he released some very sensitive uh, intel that was happening or that uh, incriminated the United States and crimes against humanity and also crimes of aggression. And these particular acts were looked upon by the U.S. government, or excuse me, this act by Julian Assange was looked at, at uh, by the U.S. government as, I believe, uh, a treasonous act or uh, espionage. Engaging in espionage was, I believe, the, the, the charge in which Julian finds himself under. But Again, so in, in my paper, I write that groups use ostracism 
is scapegoating as a means of suppressing nonconformity and nonconforming behavior. So what is nonconforming behavior? It's behavior that goes against the established order. So if the established order is that you are supposed to behave a certain way. Now, let me clarify. I don't mean any behavior that is against the law. So in this video, I'm not talking about engaging in behavior or crimes that are against the law. I'm talking about just engaging in behavior that society feels uh, you shouldn't be engaging in. So for example, we understand that the LGBTQ community, often trans people are marginalized and disenfranchised because this uh, changing of gender uh, excuse me, this this changing of gender is looked down upon by society. Society feels that, that, that there is binary genders, that's male and female, and that uh, there can only be male and female. That's not all society, for example. There is a significant portion of society that supports transgenderism and is not against trans people. But again, what's important to understand is that there is a significant portion of the population that does scapegoat trans people. So whenever there is something that is happening in society that deserves blame, trans people are often uh, shouldering that blame. And I'll give you an example. For example, we have drag shows at the public libraries and uh, drag shows, uh, drag queens that are reading to children. Now, conservative society has decided that this is, uh, they believe that this is an act that, sh that society should go against. And so now that what they've done is that they've condemned uh, drag queens and say, you shouldn't read to trans, excuse me, you shouldn't read to children. But when we look at it, how is the, the, a drag queen is in costume, just like a clown may be in costume, just like the costumes that we see in Halloween. So on Halloween day, there are a lot of costumes and there is when children are going to doors for trick or treating, we have parents, that are actually giving out candy to the children and they're in costume. And so what's the difference? We have these costumes that are very frightening, which is sometimes a vampire costume or ghost or witch. And then we have uh, costumes that are not so frightening. So what is the difference between these costumes on Halloween day and the costume on let's say for instance, uh, the drag queen costumes. Well, conservatives want us to believe that the difference is a very deviant one. And we must understand that, I think that it's important for us to recognize that not all drag queens, in my personal opinion, when they are doing story hour for children are dressing up in a very provocative way and that that means that there, is, that, that there is a grooming situation going on as conservatives would like us to believe. And as you can see in this situation, this is where all the scapegoating takes place is that now for this grooming situation, drag queens are taking the responsibility when there is real grooming that's happening within the world. And another example is that, again, when we're talking about scapegoating, I believe that this is a perfect example, and I'm getting off the subject of uh, whistleblowers and human rights defenders, and now I'm traveling to uh, trans people and the bathroom subject. So we know that in the United States and even in Western cultures, there is a very, uh, the, 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 the situation of trans people using 
a bathroom, that fits their gender identity is very controversial for a lot of people. But we should reflect on this uh, deeply. Now, I'll give an example. Most trans people who seek to use the facilities, and I'm talking about a bathroom, they seek to use the facilities because that's all that they're going in there to do is to go in there to use a restroom. Now we know that that the only trans people that are being scapegoated for this deviant behavior is trans women. So we're we're not hearing anything about trans men because again there is the idea that trans women are men by conservatives and that trans women are going into women bathrooms or, or female bathrooms to perpetuate some sort of violence again or deviancy upon women now if we reflect on this subject we understand that trans women so i'm speaking about male to female often have no desire to be with women that's uh, and i'm not saying all trans women but there is a large percentage about probably 96 percent of trans women don't have a desire to be with uh, a woman or most trans women probably about 96% don't have a physical attraction to women. And so if they don't have a physical attraction to women and they don't have a desire to be with women, they have a desire to be the opposite sex, then that means that there's no desire to attack a woman in a restroom. So, but the people that really are, when we look deeply on this subject and when we, when we look down upon it, and I'm so uh, disappointed in the trans community that they haven't explored this argument and actually looked at it fully, is that the individuals that often have, this, so what is happening, of course, in this bathroom debate is that there are heterosexual men, heterosexual men that are masquerading as trans women to get more access to women in these private spaces. That way, when and if they are found out, then all the blame is transferred not to the man that is heterosexual, is all the blame is transferred to the trans woman. And don't you see, of course, we have, in a situation like this, we have a heterosexual man with heterosexual genitalia seeking to engage in heterosexual acts with a heterosexual female, or maybe we don't know what her uh, gender identity or sexual orientation is. And yet when they are discovered and when and if they are discovered in this particular situation, then what happens is that the blame is not put on a heterosexual man, the blame is put on the trans woman. But Society does not actually put those pieces of the puzzle together. They often look at this situation as a threat to society because, of course, this uh, transsexualism and transgenderism is non-conforming behavior. And so society, most of society is in disagreement with transgenderism and transsexualism, and therefore, the blame should be on them instead of these heterosexual men who are trying to get more access to women. And so, as you can see, this is how trans women are scapegoated as well. So we have whistleblowers that are 
scapegoated by government figures such as Julian Assange. We have human rights defenders that are engaging in activism that are scapegoated often by the community in which they speak out against. And these uh, toxic authority figures who have a lot of political power and influence and then the third example is trans women who is often marginalized and scapegoated by society for their gender non-conforming uh, identity. And of course, we understand that all these groups, so if you're a whistleblower, if you're a human rights defender speaking out against the government, if you uh, are a trans woman just trying to use the bathroom what often happens is there is group identity so it's a group of people saying yeah let's go against this person because it's easier to go against people that don't have a lot of support now i do acknowledge that mr assange has a ton of support if you look at uh you know videos and news articles in London, there is a lot of people that are coming out in support of Assange because Assange has a very uh, large platform. He has a very political platform and he has achieved celebrities. So he, of course, you know, when he is attacked or when he is persecuted, there is society that is coming to his defense. But we have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that this is not everybody. So for example, you and I, we don't have these public platforms that we are, or, or celebrity to where we are getting this help that we uh, deserve. Now, you may say, Kiana, wait, we, we Googled you and we see that you have a knowledge panel and that you know there is something on Google where it looks very clear that you have a public platform. Ladies and gentlemen, this knowledge panel is used as a ruse to make it appear as if I have a public public platform when I don't. For example, if you look at my YouTube videos, you'll see that I don't have any views. I don't have any engagement. And when you look at my Twitter account, you see I don't have any views or any engagement. And when you look at the articles I write, you see that I don't have any views and any engagement. And a lot of this is the repressive aspect of transnational repression. We have cyber insurgents who are likely working on the behalf of an organized crime group or authority officials such as the Republic of Ireland and the United States that they're working in concert with each other to repress my activities. So for example, if I complain, I'm like, I'm receiving repression on my articles. I'm receiving repression on my social media profile. Well, when people look at it, they go to look at it heuristically, just on the face of it, it looks as if there's nothing wrong with it. Like, okay, this looks fine. Maybe, maybe what you're talking about hasn't engage the community maybe what you are speaking about is not important to people so they're not reflecting on it or they're not tweeting about it they're not uh liking it they're not sharing it or may maybe this public profile you have maybe you don't recognize that there is that you are a public figure ladies and gentlemen this is a ruse so for example if i go to i'll tell you exactly how this works if i go to an organization or a human rights place and I say hey listen I'm Kiana Canada and I have a public profile and I am a, a human rights defender and a B C and D is happening to me authority figures what they're doing behind the scene is saying she doesn't have a public profile look her tweets are not getting any engagement she's doing this herself she actually put this knowledge panel up herself she doesn't have any uh, followers. She doesn't have uh, any influence. So you see how that undermines my testimony as an epistemic subject. And then if I go to them and say, hey, look, I don't have a public profile. I, I, I can't get any help. And then the authority figures will look at uh, go behind the scenes and say, look, she has a knowledge panel. Look, we see her pictures uh, on Google. She has this knowledge panel and uh, 
you know, she's displayed and her articles are uh, cornerstone. And of course she has a public platform. And what this does is it keeps the cycle of abuse that these authority figures are engaging in continuous, a circle of abuse, a circle of abuse, a circle of abuse. So again, this whole, this um, having this knowledge panel, uh, the authority figures are using it to discredit me in two ways. So for example, I'll, I'll reiterate, if I say I uh, have a public platform that's on Google and I am being repressed in my uh, activism on Twitter and on, uh, and, and on Google, what the authority figures will say is, no, look, her Twitter profile is being displayed and her Google panel is being displayed. She's just not interesting enough. She's just, her activism is not touching the hearts of the community. Uh, she, you know, you can see that she's tweeting and she's writing and her writing is just not good enough. Uh, she's not getting any followers because she is just not good enough. She is not good enough. The things that she's doing is not good enough. And then when I say, hey, I don't really have a public platform. So when I tweet about stuff, when I speak out against particular situations, there is really just no one listening to it because there is repression happening behind the scenes. Authority figures are saying, no, look, she has a public platform. Her Google panel is showing that she is uh, in public, that she has some publicity and that her articles are being cornerstone. Again, reiterating, her messages are being cornerstone, but she is just not good enough. What she's talking about is just not touching the public. It's not good enough. Who she is is just not good enough. What she is doing is just not good enough. She is just not good enough. And that allows the authority figures to continue to isolate, to facilitate abuse, and to place all of the blame on people like me, people like Julian Assange, people like uh, transgender people, people like uh, activists and human rights defenders, black Americans. It allows these authority figures to continue to make us the scapegoat for the crimes and the wrongs that they're engaging in. And you have to really understand psychology and uh, sociology. These two go hand in hand to really understand the uh, manipulative influences at play here. So this video is going on long enough. This is Kiana Canada. I hope I illuminated you and gave you some information to kind of understand the psychological manipulation behind authority figures that are seeking to suppress our voices. I hope to talk to you and uh, engage in another conversation next time. Please don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Kiana underscore Canada. Right now, I'm not getting the kind of followership that I seek. It's only through your support and your believing in my human rights activity that we together can make change. Again, if they're suppressing my voice, they're likely going to suppress your voice too. Let's peacefully fight this monster together. Let's engage in peaceful activism. Let's stand up for the rights of freedom of speech and uh, stand against transnational repression. Until next time, bye-bye.